Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Andrew Holacek, who's here to share with us his new book, Reverse Meditation, How to Use Your Pain and Most Difficult Emotions as the Doorway to Inner Freedom. Does your meditation practice need a shakeup? Well, today's show is just for you. So Andrew Holacek is an author and spiritual teacher who offers talks, online courses, and workshops in the United States and abroad. As a longtime student of Buddhism, he frequently presents this tradition from a contemporary perspective, blending the ancient wisdom of the East with the modern knowledge from the West. Drawing on years of intensive study and practice, he teaches on the opportunities that exist in obstacles, helping people with hardship and pain, death and dying, and problems in meditation. Known as the expert in lucid dreaming and the Tibetan yogas of sleep and dream, he's an experienced guide for students drawn to these powerful nocturne practices. So welcome to the show, Andrew Holacek. Hey, hey, Marianne. So nice to be with you. Appreciate it. What an honor it is to have you here to talk about this book. What inspired you to write this? Well, um, I was going through some pretty challenging health situations a number of years ago, um, including uh, kidney stones, which if anybody's had these, they're among the most painful things you can possibly have. And I had learned these quirky, bizarre little meditations in the context of my three-year meditation retreat, which is something I did under the kind of the auspices of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Um, And during the course of the retreat itself, I didn't really have a ton of time to incorporate the scope, the depth, the profundity of these practices because, you know, you're doing 50, 60 different meditations over these years and they're coming so fast and furious But when I came out of retreat, I started to explore them a little bit more because I was uh, somewhat um, intrigued by the potentiality. And then when I had these kidney stones once in in the the middle of the um, night, I was able to apply this practice uh, and it was was life-changing. I was literally able to radically, irrevocably change my relationship to an extremely painful circumstance. And... Uh, transform it into something that was really basically uh, deconstructed pain. I mean, it was the most remarkable, amazing kind of thing. And and I can say a little bit more about what is involved in doing all that. But the biggest thing for me, me, Marianne, is like, geez, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, And so I figured maybe it's worthwhile sharing this with a larger population to see if, in fact, they could benefit from it as much as I have. And then I started to extend it as well for emotional duress, emotional suffering and found that it was uh, equally as applicable, if not more so, because I often have emotional states uh, more frequently than I have difficult physical states. And so the kind of the universality of these practices became more and more applicable to me. So, I mean, your book title, Reverse Meditation, that's very intriguing. So what does that mean? (laughs) Yeah, right. Well, it means a number of things. One is it's about reversing our relationship to what we think meditation is. Most of us think that meditation is about getting Zen, quote unquote, you know, kind of chilling out and, and becoming utterly completely quiescent. And I'm, I'm not dismissing that at all. I mean, when the world's on fire and your life is on fire, chilling out is a really good thing to do. But, um, these particular practices radically expand our sense of what meditation is by by inviting us to reverse our normal relationship, to actually go into the firestorms of our lives, both emotional and physical, as a way to bring them onto the meditative and spiritual path. And as I often playfully say, you know, by putting our meditation in reverse, we will find ourselves going forward. So the, the reverse of what we usually think of as meditation, it's not about running off into a solitary, um, wonderfully confined retreat. It's actually about entering the firestorms of life and then deep, obviously deeply connected to that is, 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 in fact, the reverse strategy we normally bring to emotional and physical pain, which is get me the heck out of here, either through medications. And, and I'm not speaking purely theoretically in this book. I'm a retired dental surgeon. 
I have written tens of thousands of prescriptions for narcotics. Um, I'm intimately familiar with the pathophysiology of pain transmission. I've also been involved in a number of scientific studies on pain and how advanced meditators can actually radically, it's called functional decoupling. I can talk about that to give it some scientific traction, a way to actually um, differentiate in a healthy way from our pain. And, and so it's really about, well, just to return to my question. So it's about returning, re reversing our relationship to difficult life experiences, going into them instead of running away from them, reversing our understanding of meditation. That's not about just chilling out. And as I often say, and this is important, these, these practices, they're radical, they're quirky, they're a little bit unusual, and they're completely elective. But I immediately say, hey, is pain elective? Is old age, sickness and death elective? Are hardships and life elective? Well, I don't think so. And so if you want um, to augment your skill set in conjunction with traditional pain management strategies, this isn't the panacea. It's a set of practices that should be used in a kind of integral fashion, conjoined with traditional um, strategies to really augment our um, skill set, our ability to relate to just the vast variety of difficulties in life. Well, we definitely want to get into the science in a little bit. Hey, hey. <laughs> but one of the things you mentioned in your book, I mean, you talk about reverse meditation as a kind of psychic surgery. And I'd love for you to expand on that for our listeners. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think what I was innovating in that regard is that <clears throat> there's um going back all the way to the depth psychologist and going even deeper into deep yogic theory, um, a, a large part, you know, I mean, <clears throat> neuroscientists these days say at least, and this, this data is really uh, revelatory and, and humbling, at least 95% of what we do is actually dictated by unconscious processes. And so we have buried within us in our body-mind matrix, our unconscious mind, all this undigested, unmetabolized, unprocessed experience. <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> these undigested experiences are often brought about by resistance to difficult circumstances in life. I mean, the classic psychological maxim is really true. What you resist persists. And so what we reject, what we resist, out of sight is not out of mind. Out of sight is into the unconscious mind. And there it festers like an undiagnosed psychic cyst, leaking its toxins into our life. And then our lives become um, basically symptomatic avoidance strategies, trying to run from these un unmetabolized, unprocessed earlier experiences. And so the psychic surgery is hinting at the fact that you have a skill set now where you can go in, excise, address, transform, drain, whatever metaphor you want to use, process these uh, unmetabolized, undigested, um, unconscious processes, liberating the energy that's trapped within them. And so, so a brief sidebar, an important one, I believe, in, in, to, in our uh, yogic theory, you know, according to the, the great wisdom traditions that work with subtle body, below this gross physical outer body is, is a vast complex of subtle body processes. These processes are engaged in things like Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, moxibustion, and the like for purposes of health. But the Eastern wisdom traditions also target the subtle body for purposes of spiritual transformation. And so one of the ways they talk about this rejected experience is that it actually ties your subtle body into knots. And we have all these fluid channel systems. They're called nadis in, in Sanskrit. And through these nadis flow these energies, you know, prana, lung, chi, whatever term you want to append to it. And so according to yogic theory, every time we reject experience or unmetabolized, um, unprocessed um, experience, it basically ties our subtle body slash our unconscious mind into knots. And therefore, it traps this extraordinary amount of energy. And so when people say in life, gosh, you know, I feel stuck. I feel like I can't move. I feel somewhat trapped. Well, it's because you are stuck. You are trapped. You have all this life force energy trapped in your unconscious body mind. And so this is important because people may wonder, okay, you want me to do what with these practices? You want me to go directly into that, which I've been trained both by my culture and by my biology to flee? Um, you got to have a really powerful, strong, right view to do that. Like, why on, on earth would you do that? Well, one reason is you, you just release so much energy. And so it's really liberating. It's cathartic. All this energy is accessed in size, that's the psychic surgery. 
that stuff is is liberated, drained, whatever you want to um, term you want to append to it. But the result is all this thermonuclear energy that's trapped in your unconscious body mind is then released. And so you find yourself lighter, freer, more activated, more energetic. Energies now flow more freely through you. They're no longer kind of being choked up and damned in, in your body mind. Um, so that's you know long-winded answer to a great question. That's one reason I use this image of psychic surgery. Okay. <laughs> there are no long-winded answers, you know. So it's important for us to really kind of understand how this breaks down because I was so impressed with how you really have us kind of dive into our pain first. And you're right. Most people are like, I don't want to touch that. I'm not gonna do this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so you know, of course we're gonna feel this first kind of uh kind of withdrawal from whatever the pain is. So how do we get into this place where we can really be inquisitive about our pain? Yeah. Well, you know, it starts, um, Marianne, with with a deep sense of understanding. In the wisdom traditions, they use the term right view, which is somewhat akin to outlook philosophy in Western languaging. And um, I spend a fair amount of time in this particular book substantiating the power of right view, which is so many world wisdom traditions, Sufism, um, Gnostic uh, mystical Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and many others make this radical, outrageous claim. And this is, in itself is a, is a reverse or antithetical view to Western notions of, of original impurity and original sin, that the nature of mind and the nature of reality is fundamentally pure. It's good. It's divine. And, and again, this is just well beyond the scope of what we can do here, but there are literally thousands and thousands of substantiating statements from great teachers from all the traditions that radically say, yes, the nature of your mind, no matter how crappy you may be feeling, deep within it, the nature of whatever rises is, is this kind of this perfect purity. So I, I spent a, spare, a fair amount of time substantiating that at the outset, um, because it's exactly like you said, otherwise... In the West, where we're conditioned both by uh, nature and nurture, I mean, our biology is basically fight, fight, or freeze when it comes to um, challenging situations. So we have to literally go against the, the biological um, kind of evolutionary imperatives that we have in, embodied within our DNA. And then we have the whole nurture component. I mean, like I mentioned just a second ago, our culture, society is nurtures us to basically run away from the challenges of life. And so you start with the right view um, and you test, you know, you kick the tires, you test it for yourself and you do this specifically with the practices themselves. And so in the course of the book, um, I go through two um, preliminary meditations that are really pretty foundational for, for uh, diving um, deep into these practices. And the first one is just kind of classic, wonderful mindfulness meditation. Um, the ability to settle the mind down, to, to quiesce a little bit, to kind of um, gather and cool out. And then there's magnificent and underutilized practice of open awareness, which I write quite a bit about, which is developing a capacity of the mind and heart to open. And it's interesting, Marianne, in both Sanskrit and Pali, they use the same word because it is the same word for mind and heart. Uh, Chitta, it's the same, mind, heart, it's one word. So when we talk about things like mindfulness, well, in the wisdom traditions, is equally heartfulness. So this is important because meditation in general, and these practices in particular, they're not just some cerebral cognitive gymnastic event. They're, they're highly affective, emotional, embodied practices. And so you have the right view. You have the first two preparatory practices of mindfulness and the practice of open awareness. Open awareness allows us to um, kind of uh, open our minds and hearts to unwanted experiences, to create a different holding environment, a crucible, or in Eastern language, a mandala that helps us contain and relate to the experience. And then when we have these infrastructures intact, in both the, the, the kind of the doctrinal basis, these practices, then we can enter um, very directly into the four stages of the reverse meditations. And I can walk us through those rather quickly so people get a sense of what these actually are and how they might have immediate applicability, like the minute this program is over and you want, um, start to bump into difficult circumstances, you can start to use these skill sets. Well, I'm excited to hear those. I think that that's real important to have that understanding. The, the four stages, they're... They're a little bit of candy. The analogy um, is 
we're going to be dipping into very unfamiliar and let's say really cold waters. And, and so we don't want to just jump to the very fruitional end of these quirky practices. Um, it's a little bit like plunging into super ice cold water. I mean, survival level instincts will come in and basically your habitual patterns, your, your habits, or if you like Eastern language, your karma will just, just evict you from these practices. It's like, there's just no way I'm going to do this. So we titrate our experience using a term from chemistry. We, we, we just dip our toes into the cold water, mixing metaphors. So we can acclimatize, we can become familiar. The, the wonderful word for meditation in the Tibetan language, the word is, is literally G-O-M, gom. It's a transliteration for, um, or transliterated as meditation. And it means something like familiarity or literally to become familiar with. And so when we engage in meditation, we're becoming familiar with different dimensions of our mind, our experience, our bodies, and our hearts. And so it takes a little while to become familiar with these practices. So the first step is um, observation. And, and the other really important thing here is that a person can stop at any one of these four steps because each one of these will offer a new relationship to unwanted experience. So the first step is the observational step. This is where there's a temporary differentiation. And again, there's a near enemy to differentiation, and that's dissociation. Um, so dissociation is, is basically sliding into our usual escape as default approach, right? So that's not what the first stage is about. The first stage is about getting a bead on it, um, getting a, a, a kind of a higher altitude view on <clears throat> whatever the discord is to basically provide a sense of uh, increased sense of accommodation and perspective. We often suffer because we're too close to what's happening. We're too entangled. We literally just get all wound up and entangled in the display of our own mind or, or the display of the phenomenal world. And, and so therefore part of our suffering is actually born from this type of entanglement. And so the first stage of observation, we, we step back a little bit, we get a, a better beat on it. We start to establish a new relationship just right there. And, and so that's what these practices do. They just help us understand and engage a new set of relationships to unwanted experience. So you observe it for a while. <clears throat> and for a lot of people, that alone can be magnificently transformative. Just simply putting it in, in, a, in a larger perspective, holding it in different frameworks, that in itself is curative. Um, but for those who want to go deeper, then you kind of pull this little U-turn and, and you come alongside, you sidle up next to whatever the discord is. Let's just say it's pain. Let's just say you're experiencing some physical pain. So the next step is, is to kind of come up against the pain. And the image here is one, you may have seen boxers, you know, where in the ring, <clears throat> excuse me, when they're six or seven feet apart, they can wail off and throw out a massive knockout punch because there's all this distance and space. And so when boxers get tangled up against the rope, you've seen this, they're, they're all like knotted up and tangled with each other, the best they can do is just throw a few taps in the rib. And so this is a little bit like that. You're sidling up to the unwanted experience as a way now to become a little bit more intimate with it and therefore familiar with it. So this is the first full-blown implementation of the reverse strategy, right? Instead of FedExing your awareness away from the experience, you observe it, <clears throat> now you come into it, you come alongside it to gain a greater sense of familiarity. So you be with it. The third and fourth steps, boy, this is where it gets really interesting. And so the third step is the step of inquiry and examination. And by this, what I mean, it's not merely a kind of an intellectual cognitive inquiry. It's a, a visceral and somatic inquiry. Um, this is actually established by the second phase because the second phase allows you to be with the pain. And third phase is like, okay, you ask yourself the question using your um, conceptual intellectual capacities, like, okay, what is this thing called pain? And it sends your mind in the right direction. So you ask the question, and then you start to explore it, <clears throat> not just with your, with your mind, but with your body. You start to really explore this thing, born from the intimacy of step two. What exactly is this thing that I spend so much of my life trying to avoid? 
And I'm not in any way dismissing, again, I worked in this business. I'm not in any way dismissing people who live in chronic pain. But even there, I would ask, have you ever really taken the time to know your pain? Have you ever really understood what is this thing called pain? And so by examining it, Marianne, we're starting to deconstruct it. And and here is the magic. What what these practices do is, is a brief sidebar is they fundamentally deconstruct suffering. Suffering is a construct. Suffering is an inappropriate relationship um, to pain, born of our resistance and aversion to it. So you can definitely deconstruct suffering back into pain. And then as we'll see shortly, we can even deconstruct pain back into what it actually is. And so I have a little equation here that is uh, I think quite helpful. It's um, S equals P times R. And S, of course, means suffering. P refers to pain. The R refers to resistance. Suffering is basically pain or unwanted experience um, plus or times resistance. So you do a little bit of math. You drop the resistance. What do you do? You get rid of the suffering. Then you're left with this thing called pain. Well, then what exactly is this thing called pain? Well, these practices can, in fact, deconstruct even that. <clears throat> and so they do that by doing this examination thing. What is this thing called pain? What is it made of? And then the final step is to actually go fully into the pain. <clears throat> the final step is to actually unite with it. And this is where, from the outset, people go like, you're nuts. You want me to become completely united and unified with my pain? You're crazy. Well, it may seem crazy from the outside, hence we need all this support. But boy, you get in there. You reverse your relationship, you go directly into it, you yoke to it, you unite to it. This is a game changer. And this is where the practice now becomes actually spiritual. So the first three steps are more kind of psycho, some um somatic, psycho, psychological. And it's at the fourth step that the practice becomes really, really spiritual. Oh, and I forgot there's there's one final key core question in step three, in addition to inquiring. What exactly is this thing called pain? Or if you're feeling heartbreak, some emotional upheaval, what is this heartbreak? Where am I feeling it in my body? What is it really? And then an even more penetrating question that leads as a segue to step four, who is feeling this pain? So now the inquiry goes from the experience to the experiencer. Who is it that's feeling this pain, this heartbreak, this emotional upset? And right here through these paths of inquiry, um, literally known as analytic meditations, you start to deconstruct not merely just suffering, but pain itself. And so I'll I'll just say one more little bit, and then we'll pause to see where you want to go with it. But it leads to this radical discovery that at the outset may just seem outrageous, but if you do it, it becomes your direct experience. By becoming one with your pain, there's no one to hurt. There's just this raw, intense, experiential um, awareness to which we append the label pain. So now you've completely deconstructed. There's something still there, but in in the in the most ineffable way. It's like when I had my kidney stones. So I went directly. It took a while because the pain was so intense, right? I mean, I dip into it. The, the water was so cold, so to speak, that I just immediately leapt out. But I dipped back in, I dipped back in, I knew what to do through these practices. And then finally, in a certain way, I just dove in, I surrendered to the pain. And then what was left, Marianne, it's not the easiest thing to put into words because it was truly a non-dualistic slash spiritual experience. There was something still there. It didn't feel necessarily good in the way I would normally use the word good. But here's the kicker. It also didn't feel bad. It felt just intensely real, this kind of ineffable reality. And the traditions, I I only learned this later, the wisdom traditions actually sometimes refer to this as the great bliss. It's obviously not bliss in a conventional sense, but it's great bliss in the sense that you can bring everything into this larger understanding of what, what real bliss is. And as outrageous and radical as it may appear, this is um, inherent within all the non-dual wisdom traditions. And I give a lot of support from the Buddhist tradition, from Advaita Vedanta, the non-dual Hindu tradition, from non-dual Shaiva Tantra, Kashmir Shaivism, 
So I try to bring in all the supporting data from the East and the West, the science and the spirit, the psychology, all the approaches that actually support these outrageous practices. Because otherwise, just to say over and over again, like, otherwise, nobody's going to do this stuff, right? It's so against the grade. It's so antithetical to everything we've been trained and conditioned to do in terms of relationships. So that's a long rant about how to relate to the practices um, in a a four-step process. Again, you can stop at any step. You go into it as far as you can. But if you take it all the way to the culmination point, you will find that you can discover tremendous spiritual non-dual awakening and insight in those situations that we were previously deemed completely anti-spiritual, anti-meditative. So therefore, the things that obstructed your your psycho-spiritual development now actually accelerated, now actually enhance it. On that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Andrew Holacek in regards to his new book, Reverse Meditation. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Are you an actor, public speaker, or an executive telling your story over Zoom? Jean-Louis Rodrigue and Scott Weintraub's new book, Back to the Body, takes the process they use to coach top Hollywood talent like Margot Robbie, Jack Black, and Ki Hui Kwan and makes it available to everyone. Using your body and its energy as a point of departure, your work will gain an enhanced level of performance and depth. Back to the Body, available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Every day, pets are surrendered and abandoned. For these helpless and hurting animals, Paws Humane Society acts as a voice for the voiceless, providing hope for a brighter future. You can make a difference in the life of a shelter pet. Become a humane hero today. Just $10 a month will provide much-needed food, shelter, medical care, and love. It takes a community. It takes heroes like you. Together we can. Together we will. Together we are Paws Humane. Visit pawshumane.org to be a hero in every animal story. What if everything we think we know about addiction, depression, anxiety, and trauma is missing the one key element that will actually let you walk away from them for good? My name's Bob Gardner, founder of The Freedom Specialist and creator of a body-based approach that eliminates suffering and creates happiness, health, and well-being on autopilot. You can read all about it in my book, Built for Freedom, or start your own adventure toward lasting freedom at thefreedomspecialist.com. If you want to stop divorce fast, you do not need to waste years in therapy, you do not need to work on yourself, and you do not even have to have your spouse on board. If your spouse wants out, if they're filing for divorce, separation, or having an affair, what you need is a proven process to turn your marriage around. Book a free breakthrough session with us at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. Dr. Richard London, who has 25 years of experience being known as the Man of Steel with the Heart of Velvet, presents the Life Wellness System, The Road to Yes, a mentoring system that brings you to becoming a wellness heir. Imagine having wealth, wellness, love, peace, and spirituality in abundance and balance now. Visit doctorateoflife.com or call 720-213-213. 8021 for a free 15 minute wellness evaluation. The first thing you need to know about me is that I love my kids, but they are not my everything. They used to be, but that's when my entire life fell apart. In order to pick back up the pieces, I had to put the love I have for myself before everything else, including my kids. I'm Jessica Dennehy, and I own multiple businesses. I'm a best selling author, and I have all the strategies that I've used to make my life what it is today. And I'm going to teach you how to do them in my new book, Selfish is a Superpower. So go get your copy today on Barnes and Noble or jessicadennehy.com. Announcing a revolutionary tool for wellness. Scalar Light has the ability to enhance and harmonize your own bio energies. With Scalar Light, you can get started in just minutes and begin feeling better the very next day. Scalar Light is a remote energy that gently and subtly works with your own body's bio energies, increases pro cellular wellness, and enhances your body's immunity. Experience the benefits of Scalar Light. Try a complimentary 15 day experience at scalarlight.com. 
In your hands lie ancestral patterns. These patterns shape how you think, what you struggle with, and experiences you love, your life pattern. We are going into the latest neuroscience of biological hand analysis, a realm beyond palmistry where science and the soul entwine. Hand analysis is the latest method to transform lifelong patterns. I am Master Hand Analyst Brent Bruning. Join us and visit thepowerinyourhands.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Andrew Holacek, who's here sharing with us his new book, Reverse Meditation, How to Use Your Pain and Most Difficult Emotions as the Doorway to Inner Freedom. For, let's say, someone is experiencing chronic back pain. Yeah. And they start getting into this place where they're looking and, and diving into the pain, is this something that you commonly help people with where they can understand how to move into this pain? Oh, for sure. And, and thank goodness we have the work of John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which has been around for probably three decades now. In a certain way, this is like MBSR on steroids. So this part has, has already been clinically established through John's work. I mean, MBSR is in about over 250 hospitals now around the world. And so his data is 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 supportive up to a certain point it doesn't go quite as far as stage three and four but boy it's a monumental infrastructure set of practices and i, I talk right about that as well and so um augmenting the reverse meditations with a with familiarity with mbsr is also extremely helpful but yes indeed even even when someone who has chronic pain if you're approaching this untoward chronic situation using this skill set, supported with the teaching, supported with someone who perhaps can can guide you almost in an advisory counseling capacity, um, the ability to work with this is just extraordinary. And I have to share. Let me just share one experience with you of many, Marianne. So this is. I was uh, years ago. I was writing a um, my second book, this big book on um, how to prepare for the end of life, uh, literally called "Preparing to Die." And part of my journey was I had this amazing opportunity. I was living in Kathmandu at the time. I was doing clinical work at the embassy and also a charity foundation that we started. And I had the amazing opportunity because I was servicing a lot of the orphanages and the monks and the nuns and all the monasteries in the valley to interview um, uh, 20 some really amazing meditation masters. And one master in particular, his name was Tenga Riviche. I knew him because I'd been working in, in his monastery in his, in his clinic, but I hadn't seen him in some years. And so I was granted an, an interview um, to visit with him to ask him a couple of questions about my book. Now, this is not the reverse meditation book. This is the a book from 10 years ago. And I was admitted into, into his quarters. And at first, I was I was actually taken aback. I was startled because... Here he was, this man, this man really should have been in ICU. He, I didn't know it at the time, but he was just months away from death. He, he had just had a leg amputated from, from a, a gangrene due to diabetes. He was blind. I mean, he was basically a, a train wreck. The guy, the guy should have been in excruciating pain. And I actually asked his attendant, I said, are you sure it's okay that I'm here? And Rinpoche, his name is Rinpoche, Tenga Rinpoche, he heard me. He said, Andrew, you know, come, come in Tibetan. He said, come, come. So I said, okay, I walked in there. And he said a couple of things, of course, about my book. But the most important thing was the transmission, the teaching of just being in his presence. Here was a man who really should have been max medication, should have been in tremendous physical pain. And he was just beaming with love and equanimity and kindness. And it was the most impactful transmission and I mean, who knows exactly what was going on in his amazing mind and heart, but I bet you it was something along these sorts of lines. So this man was living in, in, in a furnace of hurt. 
And his capacity, um, because of practices like this, was to create a holding environment, a container of mind and heart that was so big, so open, so receptive, that he could hold something so hot, so to speak, without being burned. Um, and so I share that with people so they so they realize it's just not metaphor. And another one, even more shocking video, you can look this up online. Um, it's Brace yourself, because it's not easy to watch, but it's called The Burning Monk. It's a, a one of the most impactful videos of the Vietnamese monk, Thich Quang Duc, who was self-immolated in protests of religious persecution during the Vietnamese War. And it's it's a devastatingly powerful video. And it shows a human being, just like you and me, completely engulfed in flames and sitting in, in absolute equi- uh, meditative equipoise and equanimity without flinching. I mean, just sitting in complete meditative equipoise is his body is being consumed by this raging pain. How on God's earth, God's good earth, can someone do that? Well, as I play, playfully say in the book, if playfully is in the right adjective, fire can't burn space. And so when one, one's mind, one's heart and mind gets so big, so spacious, so open, you you actually um, can accommodate anything. And, and one final thing here is um, I was just a couple of weeks ago with my dear friend, Richie Davidson, teaching together at a, um, he's a neuroscientist, one of the world's most esteemed scientists studying the interface between the meditative arts and, and neuroscience. And he's a founder of the Center for the Investigation of Healthy Minds. And I participated in, in a series of studies with him some 15 years ago about long-term meditators and their ability to what's called functionally decouple from pain. And so I used some of his data because I was in these studies. And so what Richie discovered in his studies, this is important to throw into the mix. What Richie's studies has, have shown with people who engage uh, in these types of practices, and uh, we're doing actually hopefully tentatively designing an overt study for the reverse meditations proper. But what's really interesting is that not not only do practitioners who work with these sorts of things literally um, have this ability to decouple uh, from the pain, but the amazing thing with these studies is when the the pain first comes on, they were really surprised to see that these meditators actually felt it more. In other words, there was a spike in, in, in the neurological response, they actually felt it more. So the little jingle is you feel things more, but they hurt you less. And so this is really quite beautiful because it's not like becoming a, a, an anesthetized, insensate human being. No, you actually literally feel more, but it hurts you less. That's a pretty good kind of deal, right? So you actually come more to life. You're more awake. You're more sensitive. You, you're, you're more sensate. But you're you're much less adversely affected by the firestorms of life. And so this kind of data surprised the scientists, and it is really a monumental, um, I think, insight in terms of what these practices can do in terms of celebrating the intense experiences of life, um, relating to them in a more skillful, open way. I always love hearing the science on all of this. There's a lot of it, and there's more coming out. And so I, I reference some of the more well-noted um, studies on this in the literature, in the book. And there's 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 quite a bit of substantiation around these sorts of things. So it's, it's pretty cool. Where do you think people get hung up when it comes to starting this practice? Oh, I think, first of all, you know, it depends on, on where you are. Like if you're, if you're already engaged in the meditative contemplative arts, if you're already on a so-called spiritual path, Those people tend to be a little bit more receptive to these sorts of things because when you're engaging in genuine spiritual practice, and I'm not talking about window shopping, window shopping is just kind of new age um, feel-good strategies. It's just an extension of your comfort plan. And I'm not categorically dismissing that. I mean, that's fine. You know, following your bliss is fine. It's beautiful. But where do you, where does your bliss go when your life falls apart, right? And so people who eventually on the psychological and spiritual path of awakening, they will eventually come up against difficult situations because meditation just loosens all these knots and all the stuff tends tends to come up. And so meditators, people engaged in inner work, they tend to be more receptive to these sorts of things. So that's one group. The second group, people who are like off the street, who who really um, aren't interested in these sorts of things, this is where the science comes in 
this is where the doctrinal support comes in. This is where the data comes in. Um, b- because otherwise, again, like I mentioned at the outset, you're, you're offering, you're inviting something that is so against the grain, so antithetical that people aren't even going to consider it. So part of this skill set in, in presenting this is really targeting and massaging the teachings, not editing them, but simply massaging them for those respective audiences. And so I, I can give you these kind of general carte blanche responses, but um, they can be pretty targeted, idiosyncratic. I mean, if somebody comes in with a particular disposition and outlook, you know, you find your ways to, to help them understand. And, uh, you know, convince is perhaps not the right word, but at least encourage them to, to ask the right questions and to inquire. And so one, one really powerful way is in fact, just that. So somebody comes in, that doesn't have any of this kind of psychological or spiritual inner work interest, you can merely invite a, a level of inquiry. And, and, and if they're really hurting, if they're not hurting, they're not going to come to you, right? right? Nobody's going to come to you if they're feeling good. They they come to these practices or any other palliative means, reductive means, because they're in pain. And so that point, when people are in pain, they tend to listen more. It's, it's like when John Kabat-Zinn was doing his work. He, he would get the people kind of last resort where they've been to all the doctors, they've seen everybody and the doctors say, I can't do anything for you. Go see John. He'll help you work with it through his MBSR thing. And so people are, are at that point, I wouldn't say they're desperate, but they're certainly more receptive. It's like, Hey, I'll, tr- you know, I'll try anything. Give me, give me something, some new skill set. And I think at that point, then the reality of their duress will open them to these sorts of possibilities. Um, but outside of that, first of all, most people would not would, would have no interest in this to stuff, right? It's only when your life world starts to fall apart that perhaps you start to look a little bit deeper in, in terms of so-called alternative ways of relating to this stuff. Well, I think a lot of people are going through that fall apart right now where mm-hmm. they're really looking for something that would work for them where maybe maybe they've dabbled with meditation in the past and that hasn't really gotten them to a place where, you know, it's kind of like that, that one uh, Seinfeld thing with the guys yelling serenity now. I mean, (laughs) it's kind of the contradictory of each other. Yeah. And this is interesting because when I proposed, uh, I had several books I proposed to my publisher, this particular reverse meditation book was, was the second of of the two books, but when they read the drafts, they said, no, we want to put this at the top of the queue and I think for exactly the, this reason, you know, just right, the world is in, in a heap of hurt. There's so much turmoil. There's so much emotional upset. There's so much challenge. And these practices really can, can add a powerful new skill set. And, um, I speak from very direct personal experience. And, and for me, really, like I mentioned at the outset, Marianne, that probably the emotional, uh, working with emotional upheaval, has been the most transformative for me because I, I experience emotional um, states, challenging emotional states, more frequently than I do acute physical pain. And, and so these same principles of the reverse meditations apply to our um, physical states. Um, and so I, let me just give you one very brief example here. Um, I This is a really just very simple colloquial over-the-counter example. I, I, I live not terribly long ago next to an airport and boy oh boy there were a lot of planes flying overhead um and i'm a writer and and i like my solitude and i found myself getting actually somewhat irritated and annoyed and so what i started to discover is again i started to ask questions it's like well why why is this so annoying so there's the power of inquiry again right why is this so irritating why is this so annoying and so every time I notice this irritation, every time I notice any kind of discord, and I write quite a bit about this in the book, I will always find some level of, of contraction. I will feel something in my body contracting. I will feel some psychological contraction. And in fact, it is that contraction that at its basis, that's what transforms um, simple pain into complex suffering. But so how this relates to the discord. So I'm, I'm sitting there and, and there's this irritating sound going overhead. And so I really started to inquire and feel in using these practices, like, what is going on? Like, why am I so bloody irritated here? And again, I, hey, don't take my word for it, man. Check it out. What I did was I go, you know, I said, I think I'm so irritated. And then I played with it. 
because I'm not experiencing this sound completely. In other words, I feel, I hear the sound, I immediately contract and refer it to me, to the experiencer. And then I run all these commentaries. Gosh, why is that plane flying so low? Why do, why do there have to be so many planes? I mean, the usual blah, blah, blah. And I realized every time I did that, that's when the sound became irritating. And it was like, oh my gosh, here I am. I'm I'm pinching myself. I'm the one's creating this duress by referring this this basically neutral sound to myself, to the experiencer. And so then what I did, and, and I, I recommend listeners just play with this. Don't take my word for it. Test it. I then became, because I'm a meditator, it was relatively easy for me to do this once I had the right view. I then took it upon myself that whenever I heard this type of sound, this uh, I tried to actually hear the, the sound as fully as I possibly could. In other words, I completely reversed my relationship. Instead of like, ah, putting my earplugs in or like, ah, this is so annoying. It's like, hey, wait a second. I want to hear this as fully as I possibly can. And I tell you, it it completely changed the quality of my experience. And so there, there's a wonderful supporting story here. When I read this, it was like, wow, this is awesome. So check this out. So um, in Thailand, there's a, a famous, wonderful Thai meditation master. His name is uh, Ajahn Chah. And allegedly the story, and it's a good one, is they were getting up at 3 a.m. to start a long day. They were doing this long kind of meditation intensive in the monastery. So they'd get up at like 3 a.m. and they'd start their morning practices and meditations and they'd run most of the day. Well, in a village nearby, there happened to be a celebration, some festival going on. And after a number of days, uh, one of the younger monks came to the master and said, you know, I, I can't deal with this anymore. The, the revelry, the noise, the party, the music is driving me crazy. And so what the meditation master said, it was just so beautiful. He said, the sound isn't bothering you. You are bothering the sound. I mean, that's the most amazing thing. So basically, leave it alone. The Beatles were onto something when they said, let it be. And so I just invite you, the next time you feel um, something, some irritation, some annoyance, that is, in fact, an indicator that you're not experiencing that, whatever it is, fully. You're referencing the experience, contracting it back to yourself. That creates this irritation. So you reverse your strategies. You actually try to feel it and hear it as fully as you possibly can. And, and so it's like T.S. Eliot once said so beautifully, music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all. You become the music while the music lasts. Bingo. It's exactly stage four. Become one with the pain. There's no one to hurt. So this is a way, try it. The next time you're irritated, annoyed, may not happen instantly because of our conditioning, our aversion, our tendencies to contract and recoil. So you have to be playful, curious, and somewhat persistent. But I invite you, and this is why this is why you do this voluntarily. So one of the things we do when I do these programs, one particular reverse meditation we do um, is we just blast the people with a bunch of noise. Not to hurt their ears, not at that level, but just really irritating, grating, static and noise. And, and people then have the capacity in this completely artificial environment. Yes, it's contrived, it's artificial for sure. But they have the opportunity to relate to this noise in a completely new way, to actually establish a relationship to it. And what I've discovered in doing this for years, there's something about these practices that downloads quickly. That, that they tend to get into our systems more rapidly. And I'm not entirely sure why. This is something maybe we can study. But perhaps I would conjecture it has something to do with the intense level of these practices and, and the, the somatic basis of them, that these are highly embodied practices. And I think because of that, literally, they become incorporated, corporeal as in body. They literally download more quickly and therefore, let me just give you examples. I'll, I'll walk down the street. It's not just a jet flying overhead, but a, a siren from a cop or a fire truck screaming by. Normally, I would contract, you know, put my ears and plug my ears and go, God dang, that's irritating. irritating. And now instead of, oh, crap, it's like, oh, wow, 
this is really interesting. So I opened to it. I completely reversed my strategy. And then guess what? My life becomes easier, more graceful, more fluid, more flowing, because I'm not whiplashing every every experience back to myself. I'm actually more open to what arises. I'm more tolerant to myself. I'm more tolerant to my world. I'm more tolerant to others. And therefore, as Williams James, Williams James said, the great psychologist, this is the cash value. This is where you start to see pretty darn quick, hey, wait a second, maybe there's something here with these bizarre meditations, right? So that's why I get excited about it, both as a clinical practitioner when I was still doing clinical work. I use these um, when, the, when the situation is appropriate. I've taught them for many, many years now. I see how they've changed people. Personally, I've been radically changed by these practices. And so to answer your first question, this is one reason I wrote the book and why I'm so excited to talk about it. Because if it works for me, I'm no different than anybody else. If it works for me, it can work for anybody. I can see people just so attracted to this type of work because it allows us to do the work on ourselves, regardless of what's going on around us, because there's always turmoil. That's it. That's it. And then what? Well, that's a beautiful thing to say. These are highly empowering practices because what they will show you, just like the plain thing, nothing actually has the power to adversely affect you unless you give it that power. And so these practices, I, my playful language, using somewhat political jargon, they're basically a peaceful transfer of power back to its rightful source, which is us. So what I say here is if you want to blame someone for your agony or praise someone for your ecstasy, look in the mirror. You know, you have these extraordinary capacities with your mind and your heart to relate to personal experiences, to world experiences in a new way that's not so highly self-referential, always contracted, referred back to me. It's more open, open, open. And so there's a there's a fundamental um, it's my favorite definition of meditation these days is a uh, habituation to openness. And these practices are, in fact, a really powerful way to habituate, to become familiar with more and more open states of mind. And so another analogy I use, Marianne, is, you know, if you imagine you have a little shot glass, you have a shot glass that's filled with water and you take a, a teaspoon full of salt. That salt represents bitter experience, pain, emotional, whatever. You take that teaspoonful of salt and you put it in the shot glass, it has a huge negative effect, right? Ah, this is nasty. Well, you replace that shot glass with Lake Michigan. You put that same teaspoonful of salt into Lake Michigan, virtually no effect. And so these practices um, move the mind from a shot glass to Lake Michigan, um, the, the mountain out of molehill thing. We suffer when our minds get so small, when we contract, right? That's, that's the resistance. That's what creates the suffering. So these practices help us open, relax. And the more we open, we're able to then accommodate. That's this whole notion, then the whole notion of like the monk, you know, kind of mixing your mind with space using that metaphor. Your heart and your mind get so big that like space, you can now accommodate anything without be, being adversely affected by anything. And that's the real beauty here is that um, you're not becoming a, a zombie or an insensate, insensitive human being. No, you're actually more sensitive. You're actually more awake. You're actually more alive but you're much less adversely affected because now you're relating to these experiences in a radically new reverse strategy. And that's the game changer right there. You mentioned earlier that while someone goes through this practice, they feel more, but they hurt less. Yeah. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that for our listeners that may be new to meditation. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, Okay, so let's say you have, let's say somebody insults you, and um, you know you you feel this you feel this zing, right? You're just like wow, like ah, you know, wow, that's a hit. And so, in an untamed, uh, untamed, untrained mind, someone whose whose mind is is more habituated to contraction, a little bit more close, a little bit more like the shot glass. 
Well, then what tends to happen, again, look at your own experience, is this is kind of, um, it's called conceptual proliferation. The word in Sanskrit is prapancha. The mind just tends to run all these narratives and stories about it, right? So, wow, okay, they said something. Why did they say that? I'm going to get back to them. And, and you start running all these narratives about the whole thing. And, and basically, what have you done? You, you've um, guaranteed your misery. Because you're you're the one that's contracting around the experience. You're the one that's like, me, 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 I, I, I. I'm the one that was so offended, right? And so the invitation here is when you have your, your zane by this experience, the invitation like reverse meditation on the spot is allow yourself to feel it 100%, right? So in other words, don't run into the narrative. And, and you'll notice this. You'll notice you're, you're running away from the actual feeling in your body. So you feel an insult. You'll feel something in your body. You'll feel a contraction in your body somewhere. I promise you. And if you don't stay with that feeling in your body, you're gonna, you, you'll are gonna contract a wave into it. You'll start the running commentary. And you'll know that because the commentary is there. You, you start thinking of all the ways you're going to get back at them or blah, 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 blah. The practice is to notice that, let that go. That's you pinching yourself. And then what do you do? You return. You simply return to the feeling that you're having in your body. And so check this out. The, the neuroanatomist, uh, Jill Bolte-Taylor, um, she writes over and over about, this is such an interesting thing, the biochemical correlates of an emotional up upheaval are purified by your body within 90 seconds. This is amazing. What this means is that if you get some type of insult, some type of emotional hit, and that thing is, is kept alive for, the, for an hour, for a day, you're in a funk, you're in a mood, you are the one that's keeping it alive. You're the one that's doing CPR on this energy that has a, has a limited somatic shelf life of 90 seconds. So your body knows how to purify this. We are the ones that keep it alive long after it should be dead. So the invitation is you look at it, you stay embodied, you stay in the feeling in your body. And if you do that, if you feel it 100%, well, guess what? It purifies. It, the, basically, the, the energy clears out, the residue is, is, is uh, taken away, and therefore, it, like using a different analogy, it doesn't have a place to land, see? So when you have an insult, if you give it purchase, if you give it a place to land, it's going to take root and it's going to grow and that's going to be your little suffering. Um, but if you allow yourself to feel it and not feed it, it's going to come through you almost like a, a neutrino. You know, Right now we have tens of billions of neutrinos that are streaming through our body, which is mostly empty space anyway. They don't hurt us because they can't hit us. There's nothing there to hit. So uh, if we don't give these experiences a place to land, if that metaphor works for you, then what do they do? The term is that it self-liberates. And even the sciences will tell you that within 90 seconds, it self-liberates. So this, this is a, a little practice somewhat similar to what I just said that I use all the time. And it's a way to engage in these practices like on the spot, like starting today. And so the practice is the next time you feel the urge to complain and like, Lordy, how often does that happen during the day right now with everything that's happening? I mean, we live in a, in a culture of complaint and look at your own experience. We are complaining all the time. So the practice here within the framework of these reverse meditations is when you next time you feel the urge to complain, pause. That creates that very brief sense of perspective of, you know, the observation thing. There's a pause. Inquire, you know, be with it, inquire. What am I feeling right now that I just don't want to feel? So you, something, you feel the urge to complain, some political things, some Hamas, Israeli things, some, you name it, right? Fill in the blank. You feel the urge to complain. Pause. Before you open your mouth, close your eyes. Check into your body. 
and ask, inquire, what am I feeling right now? I just don't want to feel. I promise you, you're going to feel some type of contraction in your body. What do you do then? Feel it as fully as you possibly can. Just be with it. Don't express it. Don't share. Take ownership. Feel it. Wake down. Feel it in your body purely. And eventually, what will happen is that particular energy will purify. It will self-liberate. It will clear through you. And this is how you avoid tying yourself into knots. This is how you avoid transplanting all these cysts, using that metaphor of undigested experience. This is how you prevent that. Or if you like Eastern language, this is how you prevent the accumulation of habit slash karma. Urge to complain, pause. Feel within. What am I feeling right now I don't want to feel? Stay with that. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything. It simply means you don't become reactive. You become responsive, right? Reactivity is born of lack of space. There's no space in your mind. There's no space in your being. Something tweaks you, some insight, insult, whatever. You contract, you react. And then from that reactivity, you just run your life spewing out all these um, perhaps not so helpful comments around unwanted experiences, right? So you don't just become like, oh, you know, turn the other cheek. And, and this like, kind of uh, the near enemy of this is this um, not so skillful acquiescence, like, ah, I don't care what happens, sometimes called spiritual bypassing. No, no, you feel it. You actually feel it more. But now instead of reacting, what do you do? You have more space. So you respond. Instead of reacting, you respond. And because of you're responding, you're doing so with more intelligence, with more objectivity, with a greater sense of perspective. You're no longer polluting the events with all your projections and your hopes and your fears. That's all born of reactivity. You actually do now what needs to be done much more accurately and effectively because you're seeing more accurately, see? And so therefore, this allows you to take ownership of all the ways we're constantly being triggered, all the ways we're constantly reacting towards um, others and also towards ourselves and replacing that with a more spacious, accommodating receptivity and responsibility. Um, and so, the, the, again, the, the cash value, the, the street level application, the traction of these practices in our daily life, this stuff is so applicable. And so I use it, I mean, I use it like, all the time, right? Every time I'm annoyed or irritated, it's like, okay, what's going on here? Why am I so annoyed? Why am I so irritated? Well, it's because I'm not experiencing that particular thing completely. I reverse my relationship. I go into it a hundred percent. And by doing that, boy, oh boy, my life is freer and lighter and more flexible and more open. And, and that's one reason I'm just so passionate about sharing these things. Well, Andrew, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Well, oh, you're so kind. So I have a couple of things. You know, everybody has their their website. My website is Andrew Holacek, H-O-L-E-C-E-K dot com. That lists all the events that I have during the course of the year. Um, there's a fair amount of that coming up. And I also have a, a, a podcast platform of my own called The Edge of Mind, um, where I interviewed a bunch of scientists and scholars and all kinds of interesting people. Um, and then for those who work in, in this particular arena that we didn't talk about at all, which are things like lucid dreaming and, and what I call the nocturnal meditations, we have a, a whole community around that called uh, literally called Night Club, playfully labeled. And it's just a way to bring support to people who engage in those sorts of practices. But um, yeah, I think most of my propaganda is on, on my andrewholacek.com website and all my programs and whatnot are listed there. So I appreciate the opportunity to share that with you all. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's a delight. Thanks for your great questions. Nice to be with you. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Reverse Meditation, How to Use Your Pain and most difficult emotions as the doorway to inner freedom. 
Reverse Meditations available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere books are sold. And remember, support our indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.